Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight as we continue our Spring Meet the Author series. My name is Erin Shea, and I'm the head of adult programming here at the library. I'd like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign, so thank you for your continued support to make programs like these available to the community. Tonight's guest first came into my universe when Jen Dayton, our head of Reader's Services, told us that we all had to pick it up, we all had to read it because it's just like Bernie Madoff if he had daughters. The Darlings begins with the disappearance of a hedge fund manager and then leads us on a fast-paced trail through the lives of the members of the Darling family at the brink of the financial downturn in 2008. It's a book that questions what is right and what is wrong, family values, and business, business ethics. Our guest this evening really knows what she's talking about when it comes to New York City. She graduated from Harvard College and from New York University School of Law. She's worked as an analyst at Goldman Sachs and as an attorney at Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hale and Door. She lives in New York City, where she was born and raised. Please join me in welcoming to Darien Library, Ms. Christina Alger. Hi, thank you guys all for being here. Um, as Aaron mentioned, I was um, an attorney in my former life, and I started writing this book um, for fun on the weekends and early in the morning. Um, and I never thought anyone would read it except perhaps my mom, who's here. <laughs> um, and so, you know, three and a half years later, here we are, and, and it's, it's a book, and I still can hardly believe it. And I'm really grateful that people will come out and hear me read from it. So, thank you. Um, I, as Aaron mentioned, the book begins with the disappearance of a hedge fund manager. Um, I was going to read a short passage from the beginning of the book and then talk a little bit about how I came to write the book and then read a passage from a little bit later in the book before opening it up to questions. He hated miscalculations. There had been a lot recently, which was, of course, how he ended up parked at the base of the Tappan Zee Bridge at 2 a.m. on a Wednesday. Not exactly plan A. His mind whirred as he parked the car and switched off the headlights. The engine fell silent, and all he could hear was the white noise of cars crossing the bridge and the rush of his own blood roaring in his ears. He sat still for a minute and stared blindly at the bridge. It looked different than it had last week. In the daylight, it looked like a steel cage suspended over the river, more like a carnival ride, a roller coaster with two peaks. The top beams were lit up, and the reflection danced across the black water below. It was beautiful. This was harder than he had thought it would be, maybe impossibly hard. He knew he had to stop and stop thinking and just move, but his heart was pumping so hard that he felt faint, as if he was having an epileptic seizure. He reached for the bottle of Dilantin that he kept in the glove compartment. He had bottles stashed in every car, just in case. His hands shook as he twisted the cap, and the bottle slipped out of his hands. He scooped up two pills from the passenger seat. There were only two left, and he put them in his pocket. You know this bridge, he told himself. It's three miles long and seven lanes wide, and there are four phones, two on each side. The storm was turning up the river. He couldn't see it in the dark, but he imagined it now, the cold, tufted rush of black water slipping endlessly beneath the belly of the bridge. Already there were sustained winds of up to 40 miles an hour, with gusts of up to 60, so the current was moving faster than normal. If someone were to jump, his body would be pulled down under into the river, swallowed whole. They might not even find the body, just a heart-deadening splash and gone. In the past 10 years, he thought, there have been more than 25 suicides from this bridge. They put in phones to connect callers to a suicide prevention hotline. The weather is optimal. This has to be done now. Running through statistics and scenarios, especially the outsider unlikely ones, the ones that others might discount to zero, usually calmed him. His breath slowed a little, enough so that he could get out of the car. His shoe hit a patch of loose dirt, causing him to slip slightly. He stopped and wiped a bead of sweat from his temple. He couldn't see the phone in the darkness, but he knew it was there, just yards away. For the millionth time, he reminded himself this wasn't just the best exit strategy, it was the only exit strategy. He had done the math, run the numbers, analyzed the risk. This was it, the only way out. So um, I began writing this book in the fall of 2008, which is around the time the book takes place. Um, 
The book turns around a wealthy New York family, the Darlings, uh, the patriarch of whom runs a hedge fund. Um, the firm is a true family business, and Carter Darling, the father, employs his two sons-in-law, one of whom, Paul Ross, is his general counsel and also the book's protagonist. Um, so without giving away too much of the plot, shortly after that introductory scene where a hedge fund manager who's Carter Darling's business partner disappears, the Darlings find themselves embroiled in a financial scandal that threatens to destroy Carter's firm and the family itself. Um, the scandal that unfolds, I think, was really emblematic of that period in New York. Um, I was working as a corporate attorney at the time, and I just felt like I was waking up every morning to new headlines about a fir one firm or other that was imploding. You know, it was first Bear Stearns and Lehman, and then it was sort of countless hedge funds and law firms that were seemingly disappearing overnight. Um, I found that fall a really surreal time to live in Manhattan and to be working in Wall Street, and I think. Um, my response to my job, which was very stressful at the time, was to write about it and to kind of explore what was going on around me um, by writing about it in, I think, a fictional and slightly more lighthearted um, way. So I, The Darlings, to me, though, isn't really a book about Wall Street. Um, it's really a family drama that I've set against this financial backdrop. Um, I became sort of intrigued when I was reading all these stories of Ponzi schemes and financial crimes that were filling the headlines about the families behind those scandals. And so I wanted to explore the idea of a family that's sort of accustomed to sitting on top of the world and wakes up one day and finds that their world is crumbling around them. Um, I grew up around a family business myself, and so I've always been sort of fascinated by how complicated um, things become when family and business are enmeshed with each other. And so that was sort of what I wanted to explore when I was writing this book. Um, the next excerpt that I was going to read um, is probably my favorite passage from the book. And it's, um, it focuses on Meryl Darling, who's Carter's daughter, and Paul Ross's wife. And she's sort of reflecting on her family and her life in New York in the wake of the scandal. And trying to come to terms with whether or not living in New York is right for her. Merrill had always been quietly guarded, particularly with men. Before Paul, there had only been two boyfriends of any consequence, and she had avoided casual dating in between. Inez and Carter had raised both girls to be cautious of everyone. This is New York, Inez would say about anything from taking the subway to going on a blind date. You never know who anyone is in New York. You have to be careful. Merrill and Lily had many acquaintances but few friends, and typically dated men who they met through friends and family. Sometimes, more often after she met Paul, Merrill wondered what she would have been like if she had grown up outside New York. Would she be herself, but more open, less circumspect, sunnier, less sarcastic? Manhattan children were like armadillos, sharp clawed and thick skinned, deceptively quick moving. They had to be. Manhattan was a Darwinian environment. Only the strongest survived. The weak, the nice, the naive, the ones who smiled at passers-by on the sidewalk. They all got weeded out. They would come to New York for a few years after college, rent shoebox apartments in Hell's Kitchen or Murray Hill, work at a bank, wait tables, audition for bit parts in off-Broadway productions. They'd meet other 20-somethings over after-work drinks at bars in Midtown, get laid, get their hearts broken. They would feel themselves becoming impatient, jaded, cynical, rude, anxious, neurotic. They would give up. They would opt out. They would scurry back to their hometowns or to the suburbs before they had a chance to breed. The ones who stayed long enough to raise children were the tough ones, the tenacious ones, the goal-oriented ones, the gold-digging ones, the deal-closing ones, the killer-be-killed ones, the ones who subscribed to the philosophy, whatever it takes. They looked out for themselves and slept with one eye open. Being born in New York wasn't enough to make someone a true New Yorker. It was in the blood, like a hormone or a virus. Merrill often doubted whether or not she had it in her to stick it out in Manhattan with kids. The older she got, the more she wondered if she wouldn't be happier somewhere quieter, less stressful, or less competitive. Were they really willing to fight tooth and nail the way her parents had? toiling away at their 100-hour-a-week jobs to live in their 1,500-square-foot apartment with its troublesome electric stove, shelling out $34,000 a year for a single tuition at Spence. 
not to mention what they'd spend on clothes and nannies and gymnastics just so their child didn't feel wildly behind her peers? And could they possibly bear to spend every summer weekend with her parents once they had children? That seemed unreasonable, but you couldn't keep a child cooped up in an apartment in August when her classmates were playing tennis or riding horses. So in addition to the million dollar mortgage they were carrying on their apartment, they would need to consider at least a small summer rental in the Hamptons. What would that run them? $50,000 a season? A hundred? And was it true that the top SAT tutors cost $1,000 an hour? Who had the stomach for these kinds of numbers? For even the very rich, this sort of daily calculus required a steel nerve and a ruthless will to succeed. Merrill would see school children on Park Avenue, golden-haired cherubim in pinafores and Peter Pan collars, and she would think these are the offspring of killers. So <laughs> that's the end of the paragraph. Um, th if anyone has any questions, I guess I, the, my favorite part of this is talking to everyone about the book. So um, I guess I will open it up for Q&A. Yes? Do you still live in New York? I do. <laughs> I know. I, I read this now over and over again on my book tour. And I guess it, it does make me question whether or not I want to stay in New York. But I did grow up in New York. And um, you know, I have sort of a love-hate relationship with it, and I think that comes through in this passage um, in sort of a lighthearted way. Um, but it is a difficult place to live, and um, I think a lot of my friends who also grew up in New York are kind of struggling with these issues now as, you know, we start having families and children. So I guess it was very much on my mind at the time I wrote it. So, but I am here for... My mom, my mom's raising her eyebrow, but I am staying in New York for, for the foreseeable future. Yes? I'd love to know to what extent people you knew in real life ended up in the novel. Your mom was talking about it a little bit before the event. But I know that writers generally have to write what they know. And I know it's hard sometimes to keep the people you know out of your writing. So I just wanted to know if you struggled with that at all or if you found there are amalgamations of things. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, both consciously and subconsciously, I definitely drew from not just people I know in my own life, but you know, stories that were happening at the time and sort of real life characters on Wall Street and who were in the newspaper. Um, but I think you know, at some point you start working with these characters every day and they become like real people to you who are just something wholly apart from the people that they might have been based on originally. So it's funny because I find it really hard to see anyone in the book as based on a particular person because I see them as like real people that, you know, to me are fully developed now in my own mind. Um, so, but I think that's sort of the fun of fiction that you can kind of pick and choose, you know, anecdotes or nuances or little sort of subtle personality traits from people, you know, around you and, and sort of blend them in a way that, um, you know, makes the most sense for your story. So, um, but there's definitely, there's a lot of me in there. There's a lot of, you know, I guess my life in there. Um, but I think it probably comes out in ways that, you know, aren't, um, that you wouldn't expect, you know, just in sort of the way Meryl sees, you know, the street in front of her or the way a friend of hers tells a story, just like small things that are probably more subconscious than anything else. So. Yes. What kind of law did you practice? Did you uh, practice securities laws or law? I, I started out as an M and A lawyer, and I very quickly became a distressed M and A lawyer, and then a bankruptcy lawyer. So, um, I I came out of law school at a very strange time. Um, in '07, um, you know, I, I had a finance background. I had worked at Goldman, so um, I knew I'd go into the corporate department, um, and. You know, the most exciting group was to go into M&A, and by the time I left, the most exciting group was definitely bankruptcy. So um, <laughs> it was an interesting time um, to be working in law, but um, but I guess I was more of a bankruptcy attorney than anything what else. What attracted you to law school? And it sounds like you're not practicing law anymore. No, I'm not. I'm writing full time now. Um, I don't know. That's a good question that I still wonder why I went to law school. But um, I guess you know, I was an English major in college, and I think the sort of practical um, thing that you know English majors don't have, there's not a big market for English majors, but going to law school is kind of a practical application of um, you know 
having reading and writing skills, I guess. So I always thought that maybe I'd go to law school and I wanted to work for a few years before, so I went to Goldman. Um, but I just sort of wandered my way into law school, I guess. And yeah, I, I would have thought most of your colleagues at Goldman went for an MBA. They did. I went back to the street. They did. I was not a finance person, and I knew that going into Goldman, and Goldman reconfirmed that for me, and I never wanted to look at Excel again. So <laughs> I ran from business school. And the nice thing about law school is you get there, and lawyers are terrified of numbers, so it was great. I like My background was actually really helpful, um, but I don't think I could have hung in there for <laughs> two years of business school. Yes? You, I think you've half answered my question by this guy's answer. Uh, so you wouldn't go back to Wall Street because you're having too much fun talking about it, as opposed to being part of it? Um, I mean, you know, I, who knows? My career is so different than I thought it would be five years ago that it's hard to say I wouldn't ever do anything. But, um, but I am working on a second book now. Um, so at least for the next few years, I get to call myself a writer professionally, which honestly is too much fun for me to. So hopefully I can do this for a long time. Um, but, you know, I guess. Never say never, though. <laughs> yes? You mentioned in your opening comments, I think, that you started writing basically as sort of a, a way to step back from your regular you know, daily grind. Was, was there a moment when you started looking at what you were writing and saying, hey, this isn't too bad. Maybe I can do something more than just use it as a, you know, a daily cleansing of, of my <laughs> downtown? Um, you know, it, it's funny. I. It took me a long time to get there. I, I have I had a friend, I had a couple friends from Harvard who were English majors with me and always knew that I wanted to write. And one in particular was very persistent and she always asked to see what I was writing. And she's a writer and she she's a very successful writer and so she kept hounding me and so I finally sent her what I was working on and she sent it to her agent without asking me. And her agent called me at work, which was really surprising. And it was the first time that I thought that maybe this could really be something. Um, and then it took about six months of sort of emotional back and forth. Um, but it's, it's hard to, when you're working as hard as I was, it's sort of hard to have the time to commit to this full time. So I knew at some point I'd have to make a choice. And, um, I just got very lucky because I found a wonderful editor who was willing to work with me. Um, yes? Did, did that agent become your agent? <laughs> no, that agent didn't. Um, it was funny, I was so thrown, I was really caught off guard by it and so we had lunch and she's, she's wonderful and very nice and she and I have stayed friends, um, but she's, she's actually a very high profile agent and she, she was sort of like, look, I'm very busy and just call me when it's done. And I thought, well, at the rate I'm going, that's going to be like 20 years from now. So I, I kind of, if I'm going to do this, I need someone who's going to hold my hand through this. Um, so I talked to a friend and said, you know, what do you think I should do? And she said, you should probably talk to a few agents, you know, just to understand what they do and see, um, you know, who would be a fit. And do you want to talk to my friend Pilar? who probably won't represent you, but she's very nice, and she grew up in New York, and I'm sure she'd point you in the right direction. And Polar is now my agent, so I don't know. It just, we seemed to work well together, and she was very hands-on with me, which I needed at the time. So um, I used to email her constantly with like short paragraphs and asking what she thought about it, and I think most agents don't give their writers that much attention, so I got really lucky. Fantastic. <laughs> Yes. I just answered this question this morning, um, so I have a really well-formed <laughs> answer. Um, I, you know, it's funny. Meryl and I have the most in common. Um, she's about my age. She grew up in New York. She went to Harvard. She went to law school. Um, and the paragraph that I just read, you know, to some extent, is my own kind of internal monologue, but. Um, I think the character that I associated most with is Paul, who's the protagonist of the book, um, which sounds a little strange, but um, he's really an outsider who gets to kind of peer into this very insular family. And I think as the writer, that's a little bit how you feel too. You're kind of on the outside looking into this family. And so he, he, I sort of associated with him. I felt like he was my window into this world that I otherwise wouldn't be able to see. So. 
I guess, I don't, it's still strange and people still ask me why my protagonist is a man and I can't really answer that well, but there it is, so. Yes? Um, you obviously, you said you started writing this book when you were, were working um, at Goldman um, and now you're writing full time. What is your writing, when do you write, what is your writing process and it must have changed because you, when did you write when you were working full time? That must have been really hard. I did. I was. I wasn't. I was at my law firm, but it was a similarly sort of grueling schedule. Um, I wrote mostly at my law firm. It's still hard. I look back on it and I can't imagine how I did it because now I write all day, and so to me, it's a, a full time job. Um, and I don't know how I balanced it, but I think being a lawyer, you have a lot of downtime because you're sort of always available for clients, but um, sometimes you're just in your office waiting for them to get back to you. And so at some point I realized that I could either like online shop or I could write a book and that was, it was a lot cheaper to write a book. So it was just what I did to fill, you know, 45 minutes here or there. Um, when I left, um, I, you know, it became a full-time thing and my schedule changed so dramatically. Um, I really can only write for about four hours a day. And it took me a long time to realize that because when you're used to working like 12 hour days, you feel like a total slacker if you only work four hours and then you're exhausted. But I just, I'm just not productive. Um, and I think most writers feel that way. It's just a different kind of discipline. So I try and write for two hours in the morning and then take a break and then two hours in the afternoon. And then if I'm lucky, I write for an hour after dinner. Um, but I do that seven days a week. So that's sort of how I write now. Um, and, but it's been sort of an evolving process. Um, now I'm sort of balancing interviews and, um, you know, speaking engagements with writing my second book. So um, I'm probably doing less writing than I should be. <laughs> so, yes? Would you be willing to share with us what your second book is about? Yes. Um, I, so I, there's a character in this book. I didn't want to write a sequel, um, mostly because I started writing it before this came out and I had this all-consuming fear that no one would read this and then I'd be writing a sequel to a book that no one read, um, which doesn't make any sense. So, But I became really fascinated by Bill Robertson, who's the district attorney in this book, who's a very small character who kind of appears at the beginning and the end. But he's ultimately the one who, this book takes place over five days for those who haven't read it. So a lot of questions are left unanswered and he's sort of ultimately the person who you know is going to end up prosecuting people in this book. And so my second book turns around him um, kind of post this uh, financial crisis and this you know scandal and he's now running for governor kind of on the back of being a very successful DA. So that is my second book. It may change because I'm still working on it. But anyone else? I tried to. Um, it was it was really important for me that people. I, I one of the things I really wanted to do is make people that worked in New York at that time feel like it was a real, feel like they they remembered it this way and it felt real to them. So I tried to be pretty disciplined about doing a lot of both like legal research and also just research, like I remember like obsessively looking up what the weather was like during this five day period and that kind of thing. Um, so I tried to be as accurate as I could, um, but. I mean like with stuff that went on with like, the financial <clears throat> crisis and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean I, you know, I also had the benefit of working during that period, so I felt like, so I was kind of learning by osmosis, but, um, but I, I tried to do as much research on like the crimes that were going on um, at that time as I could and um, being a lawyer's research is sort of what you do all day so it was a good discipline for it. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't go to Spence. And strangely, my agent went to Spence. And she thought she was like, she couldn't decide if she was like annoyed or pleased that I made the girls go to Spence in the book. Um, I went to Chapin, which is basically like Spence with a different uniform. And 
I first thought maybe I shouldn't use names of any school, but then I realized the school isn't really, you know, praised or maligned in the book. It just is the school they went to. And for whatever reason, I didn't want it to be the school I went to because this, char these, this character is so close to me in terms of her background that I just was like, everyone's just going to think this is a story about me and my family. So I changed small, strange things, like, and so they ended up going to Spence. But um, I don't know if Spence is happy about that or not, but <laughs> there it is. So yes? So how far away was the final version from your first draft? Oh my gosh. Um, well, mom can answer that probably better than I can, because she read like like a hundred drafts of it, which means she's very patient. But the first draft was really far away. Um, I didn't outline it because I was working on it for fun. And so it just never occurred to me, like outlining to me is boring and so I didn't want to do it. And that meant that I deleted a lot and um, you know, would sort of get halfway down a path and realize that it didn't make any sense and I'd have to you know, really substantially revise it. Um, so the first hundred pages that I gave to my agent I imagine are like not even in this book, or if they are, it's like in very altered form. But the the family itself and the characters, I knew right away. Like I knew exactly who I wanted to be in the family, and so that that was sort of the structure that carried me through. Um, and then the editing process was really involved. I mean, the book I sold was a complete book, but it's a very different book than this book, and. I have a great editor who I trust and respect a lot, and so I was very open to her suggestion. This is a follow up. So, what was the biggest impact, the biggest thing that the editor did to that version that you presented? Um, the biggest thing I think is that she really liked the kind of B cast, as it were. My book was really about the Darling family, and they're kind of all these secondary characters, like the lawyers that are investigating them and a team of journalists that's following the story um, that are kind of all interwoven. But they were much less developed when she got the book. And she, was, she really liked the kind of multiple storyline aspect. And she really wanted it to be kind of more of an ensemble cast. Um, and so a lot of the work I did was going back and developing the backstory of those characters and kind of flushing out their their arc. Yes? Have you read your reviews? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not easy. It's strange. I, it's funny because they ask you when you start, you start getting reviews before the book comes out, you know, from like Library Journal and Publishers Weekly and and my publicist said, do you want to read them? And I thought that was such a weird question, because like, how can you not read? It's like on the internet now. It's not like, so if you Google yourself, which is tempting, um, it's right there. So I said, sure. And she was like, you know, a lot of writers don't read it, or they don't want to read the bad ones, which I thought was kind of funny, too. So I just, I, I'm, I just, I, I'm too curious, so I have to read it. But I'm learning to take it all with a grain of salt. <laughs> Yes? So when you were done and the book goes out, how satisfied were you? Was it, or do you feel like it was good enough, but you would have done something different, or, or more, or whatever? I mean, how satisfied were you when you thought it came out? That's a tough question. Um, I guess I was, I think we got to a place where we all felt like it was as good as it was going to get. There's kind of a point where you're like, you don't know if you're just changing stuff for the sake of changing stuff, or you're actually productively working on it. And I think you can kind of work on it forever. Um, and you know, there are mistakes in the book. There are things I wish I could change now. And I think every writer feels that way. And you just have to sort of make peace with, you're at like a good stopping place, and it's just time to put down your pencil. Um, but I was pretty happy with it. Um, I think the major, like the biggest things that we changed, like adding an introduction and epilogue, which weren't there before, I really liked and I was really happy that we changed it in that way. So, um, but 
I was still like emailing the copy editors like right before the book went to print like could you please change this on page 83 and they had to be like no we're, we're done now you have to stop so <laughs> it's hard to let it go <laughs> Thank you. Christina is here to sign books if you have a copy. Otherwise, Barrett Bookstore is here to sell books if you don't have a copy yet. So thank you everyone so much for thank coming you. tonight. Thank you. Christina.